Meet the kids who won't eat, won't sleep, won't behave. And the parents who take the rap. We've been slated left, right and centre. People say, that boy needs a good smack. Even Granny thinks Mum just needs to get a grip. She's a little bit lazy. Well, she is lazy. <laughs> Mum and Dad are desperate for a label like ADHD or autism... Oh. Why, why, Mum? ..to explain their child's behaviour. I think Billy's autistic. I suspect maybe ADHD. If it's not autism, what is it? <laughs> But could tough love be the solution? No! Is this just a naughty boy? It can take years for parents to get a definitive answer. This is what I'm up against, so, it, you know, I'm just getting nowhere. So family GP Dr Dawn Harper and paediatrician Dr Ravi Jairam are tackling this controversy head-on, fast-tracking the process to see if medical help is needed. Do you think they're ready for this diagnosis? Or if the kids are just out of control. Yeah! Two desperate mums have contacted GP Dr Dawn and paediatrician Dr Ravi because they're frustrated that no one is taking their worries about their son's bad behaviour seriously. In six weeks, the doctors will give them a definitive answer, but will he be the one they want? Do their children need a label? or just some tough love. First, three-year-old Billy. Hello. In the scenic foothills of Monmouthshire, single mum Robin and three-year-old Billy appear to lead an idyllic life. Two, three. Oh. I can't. Oh, have you got one? A little fish. A little fish. But Robin believes there's something seriously wrong with Billy. It winds me up that people are so ignorant that they don't realise that, yeah, there is disabilities out there that they can't see and, oh, there could be something wrong with this child. Ah. I caught, I caught, I caught a shark fish! Don't hiss at me cos you're angry. And the problem's most noticeable first thing in the morning. I just go on to eat my breakfast. Come on. Go on my breakfast. <laughs> you're not eating it. Yeah. Right, if you don't eat your breakfast, I'm turning your cartoons off. <laughs> Don't. Please. He's thrown his quad bike at me. He's split my lip open. Right. Teddy's going off. No. Billy. <laughs> so this is Billy. He's three and a half. He lives with his mum. She's young. She's 21. They live in Wales. Dad's not around. There are no siblings. Okay. And can become quite aggressive. Um, he doesn't sleep particularly well. Ten past eight at night. And this monster is still running around. Kaboom! Kaboom! Bed, please. Come on. No, I don't want to go to bed. I do try to get him to bed about half seven. Billy, come on now, please. Put the book back, please, and get into bed. When Robin finally gets her little monster into bed, she has to read to him for three hours before he finally falls asleep. Billy will finally give in about 11, 12 o'clock. He will just keep getting it, God knows how many times in the night. The next morning, Billy's tired and grouchy and doesn't want to go to nursery. What? Time to get up! <laughs> no! No! Don't! No! <laughs> uh, no! <laughs> to my mind, I'm watching that and I'm thinking, actually, there's, there's a little boy here, he's just three, and he's, he's really quite in control of the way that house works. And it looks like Mum's main concern is that Billy has very rigid patterns of play. Mum is concerned that all of this might point to him being on the autistic spectrum. Autism is a communication disorder which affects how the mind is wired. One of its better-known traits is a compulsion to put things in a rigid order or sequence. Like the bricks in their back garden. Billy, why must all the bricks be in a line like that? Why is it important? Because it is. The lining things, uh, the anger, uh, it's, it's just obvious. <laughs> and with Billy growing up fast, Robin's very keen for him to get an autism diagnosis. The reason I want the diagnosis is because he starts school next year and I don't want him going in and being seen as the naughty child. 
She's not afraid of her son having the label because her own brother, Aaron, has the condition. <laughs> Robin's brother, Aaron, has autism and I've noticed an awful lot of similarities between Billy and Aaron. Uh, no, the other side, no, over here. There, right, that's just right, thank you. <laughs> Aaron is very hyperactive like Billy. Go! Yeah! Aaron doesn't always sleep at night. Go. They are two peas in a pod. <laughs> And Billy's uncle Aaron likes putting things in sequence too, obsessing about his favourite objects, motor cars. Yeah! I love minis, I do. Um, they're made by BMW. You can have them in petrol, diesel. The doors open like that. It's got a digital radio. Animals talk non-stop. You can have all different kinds of wheels. They've got a chrome exhaust. He doesn't stop talking. When you order it, you can have special mats. You can have it on all different kinds of colours. Mum is convinced Billy shares this autistic trait. Billy's obsessed with the television. Cartoons constantly have to be on when he gets up in the morning till he goes to bed at night. Mum clearly has a lot of awareness of autism yes, because she? her brother's autistic. Whatever we find with Billy, lovely looking little kid, oh, sweet. Um, you know, Mum needs some help. The doctor's second call for help is from Cumbria where another single mom has been struggling with her out-of-control son for four years. OK, this is Charlie. Uh, he's eight. He lives with mum in Cumbria. Mum's put together a nearly 30-page summary of all the worries she's got about him. Shall we have a look at him? Let's have a look. Charlie doesn't go to school. He was kicked out when he picked on someone bigger than him. I threw a snowball at my headmaster's face and once I chased him around with a wet floor sign and I trashed the classroom because he would get me so angry. Your average eight-year-old does not challenge the headmaster at no. school. <laughs> no, you might think about it, but you wouldn't dare. You it's would know not to. It's a line you don't cross. Charlie is a home tutor but spends most of his time playing computer games. But his mum thinks his reaction when things don't go his way isn't typical. No! I sometimes describe him as Jekyll and Hyde. Calm down. He is totally unpredictable. Right, I'll turn it off then. No! He can turn in an instant. No! When I get cross, throw stuff, punch my mum and stuff and push her. No! It's Charlie. She just gets me really angry sometimes. Do the wrong thing, <laughs> take him to the wrong place, he will have a major meltdown. Don't go everywhere! Nice. She copes, but when she doesn't cope, we try and cope. Right, I think uh, I'll leave him for a minute. <laughs> we are going to take a trip over to my parents' house, Charlie's uh, grandparents' house and I thought we'd go and have a visit to them, see how he gets on. We're going to show you the house! <laughs> Charlie is an enigma. He can be such a wonderful child. This is the front room. we got the TV. He just does not stop when he's in this mood. we got Grandad's chair. He's just up here, constant. Talk, 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 talk. Oh, crikey. And I've got my hand grabber. That's the most fascinating thing in the house. And we've got a joke book. Hunter goes to a butcher's shop and asks for a duck. I'm sorry, says the butcher. We're out of duck. How about chicken? Oh, yes, replies the hunter. And how do, how do I tell my wife I shot a chicken? I don't get it. <laughs> GP Dr Dawn and paediatrician Dr Ravi are trying to find out if kids like three-year-old Billy need a medical diagnosis or stricter parenting to get to the bottom of their challenging behaviour. And I've asked you not to, and I've asked... But with eight-year-old Charlie, they've really got their work cut out. You hate me. Well, that's nice. But 
Currently excluded from school and home tutored, Charlie now only agrees to leave the house to visit his grandparents or to walk the dog, finding company in his computer games. This is me. Charlie doesn't have any friends. He's, he's tried to make friends in, in schools. Um, he will see them as, as his friends, but he never gets invited anywhere. Life has become trapped, isolated. Charlie doesn't want to leave the house. And it's not a good way to have friends, really. Well, if we go to the shops later, we can get some more milk. Yeah. Well, that's all I've got, so you can either finish that up and we'll go to the shops and get some more. I don't want to go to the shops. Why? But what? But we need to get milk. He doesn't want to do anything. He doesn't want to go anywhere. He gets kicked out of the clubs that he tries to join. Now he just doesn't even join them because it's, what's the point? What about the park? I think what he's trying to do is avoid situations that he might recognise might make him melt down. Having no friends and always staying in means that the only person he can vent his frustration on is his mum. There was uh, a time when Charlie was having one of his meltdowns. I was at the top of the stairs and he was pushing and pushing and pushing me and I slipped and I came down and I fell. It wasn't a case of that he'd come down the stairs to see if I was OK. He came down the stairs and carried on kicking me. Mm. Gosh, he's a big lad as well, isn't he? There were times when I've actually had to physically call the police out on a six-year-old child because of the violence. The police have been here twice because I've really hurt my mum. The police came out and at first it was a case of, this is absolutely ridiculous, can you not control a six-year-old? Well, they walked in and they, they'd, they'd never seen anything like it. Got into the kitchen and where I'd been making sandwiches, there was a knife on the side and Charlie actually picked that up and came at me with the kitchen knife. And I had to have the kitchen door shut. OK. And I'm holding the kitchen door and he's through the other side waving and branding a knife at me. And that, that's... It's heartbreaking. What else do you have to say? Sorry. All right. It's really difficult because I've got such a loving child. But when he goes, he's just a different child. Oh, completely. bless her. She's broken, and isn't she? I don't understand where it comes from. I feel bad after hurting her and punching her and pushing her. Killing. <laughs> I love my mum. <laughs> no! <laughs> you can't cope with that on your own 24-7. Is this just a naughty boy, or is there more to it? Do Charlie and Billy have underlying medical conditions which explain their bad behaviour? Don't. Or are there other explanations for their naughtiness? They'll go everywhere! Dr Ravi's first stop is Monmouthshire, where young mom Robin is convinced her three-year-old son Billy has autism. The difficulty is that some of the behaviours described could well be within normal limits for a three-and-a-half-year-old. Um, but I was particularly interested in the fact that she says that when he plays, he likes lining things up. Hi. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you, Ravi Jiram. Hello. Are you Billy? How old are you? Three! Children may, from time to time, want to line things up, but I want to see whether he plays with things in a more normal, imaginative kind of way or whether that's all that he does. Obsessive behaviour is just one of the characteristics of autism. Dr Ravi is looking for some of the other telltale signs as well, such as if Billy gives him eye contact. Oh, I can see one here. That's a new one. It's rusty. It is a bit rusty, isn't it? It doesn't drive. Oh, is it broken? Can you fix it? My toolbox is going down to yours. Oh, should we get your toolbox? Yes. We've got the toolbox, and what colour did you say it was? Did you say it was red? Yeah. When he took me to find a toolbox, I was fully expecting a toolbox to come back. He fooled me completely. Here's the spanner. Can I see you fixing the car? Oh, it doesn't just fix cars. It makes things, red things, yellow. Yellow things, red. <laughs> he had an incredible imagination. The idea of having the concept of a, a magic spanner that can change co the colours of things was really amazing too. The behaviour that Billy displayed really, to me, shows a child with a vivid imagination, with good social interaction. Stick your tongue out for me and say, ah! Uh. 
I think it's very difficult for one professional seeing a child to make a, a diagnosis one way or the other. Clearly some of his behaviours are challenging and we need to look into why they're challenging and find strategies for mum to deal with those. He said that we need to see other people so we're going to do that. Billy is one big mystery to everyone at the moment. <laughs> Charlie's mum is convinced a development disorder is responsible for his bad behaviour. But for four years, she's had a fruitless battle trying to get him assessed by all the necessary medical experts who must then agree, as a team, to give him a diagnosis. This folder here contains just really a small part of just the correspondence that I've had going with um, all the healthcare professionals. Other things are from schools. Four-page letters going out to the paediatrician's behaviour book. As you can see, he got quite angry with. This is what I'm up against, so, it, you know, I'm just getting nowhere. Nothing's being done. She hopes today's visit from Dr Ravi will vindicate her belief that Charlie isn't just willfully naughty and prove that his uncontrollable behaviour is due to an underlying medical condition. Hi, hello, are you Charlie? Yeah. Nice to meet you, Dr Ravi. Is it all right if I come in? Yeah. Brilliant. Hi. Although Charlie can't face joining the discussion. Yeah. Would you rather stay in there? I don't mind. Charlie, you're not going to put your Xbox on, though, are you? But true to form, that's exactly what he does. One of the big things that we've seen is his tendency to, to melt down and, mm. and have quite a lot of anger outbursts. Have you identified the kind of triggers that might make them happen? Literally anything, any, any right. demand you put on him, anything you want him to do that he's not ready to do. When he was at school, how did he get on with other children? Very difficult. Any games that were played had to be controlled by Charlie. OK. Um, he used to get quite violent with them as well. All right. Now, he spends quite a lot of time with his grandparents as well. Yes, he does. What have you observed about how he plays? We never actually play with him because he plays with us, but by himself. Well, that's an interesting way of putting things. So basically, he wants you there and wants your attention. Oh, yes. But he wants to do it how he wants to do exactly. it. Exactly. It'd be really helpful to go and have a chat with Charlie now. Hi, Charlie. Charlie, hello. How are you doing? You can give me five. Your mum was telling me that you're not going to school at the moment. Did you like going to school or do you prefer not going to school? Not going. Why didn't you like school? Because they always used to tell me off for stuff that I didn't do. All right. Is there anyone you play with? And my friends on the Xbox. Do so you like your Xbox friends? Are they better than people really being there? Yeah, kind of. Right. If we get into a fight, then we don't hit each other. All right. He has rigid behaviours. He takes things very literally indeed. He doesn't like change and he's not particularly keen on socialising and mixing with other children. No. Right, I will see you later on. Bye, bye bye. In terms of a diagnosis, there's a number of things that could be going on, but I'd really like to explore further the possibility of the autistic spectrum. Cheers, bye. Thank you, bye. About three quarters of a million people in the UK are on the autistic spectrum. This means they may need help with communication and social interaction, but it can only be diagnosed after a number of experts have carried out specialist assessments. Robin and grandmother Tracy are convinced that Billy shows signs of autism. I'm gonna go see the lady about you talking, because you talk too much. <laughs> I'd quite like to get Libby, our speech and language therapist, to see him to do a formal assessment for autistic spectrum disorder. Oh. Libby is a speech and language therapist, but her primary concern isn't stammers and stutters. She wants to know how Billy expresses himself and if he understands what others are telling him. If I tell you what to do with these, can you put the spoon on the plate? Easy peasy. Put the tractor on the chair. A lot of what I did with Billy just then looked like play. But I was looking for attention, listening, whether he could recognise emotions. Can you show me a sad face, Billy? Mm. And looking for little clues that might let me believe whether he was on the autistic continuum or not. If Billy is on the autistic spectrum, he's likely to take things literally. 
struggle to hold a two-way conversation and misinterpret facial expressions or pictures. Why is the boy happy? Because it's his birthday. How did you know it was his birthday? Because there's a cake in prison. That's right. That's a very clever answer, that is. Charlie! We're going to come and get some shoes on, babes. We're going to go dog walking. One thing we do know is that one in five children with autism have been excluded from school. Come on, please. Turn that off. No. Charlie. Charlie's been excluded from school. No, 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 no. Come on. I hate you. Come he on. has some tutoring at home, but whiles away the hours, obsessively watching TV and playing video games. He hates it when his mum even tries to get him out of the house. Shoes. No. Shoes. No. Shoes. No. Shoes. No. Today, Maxine's finally managed to drag him out of the house to walk the family dog, Murphy. Okay, can you wait, please? <laughs> Murphy! He's got a tree up here that he climbs. He stays in the tree while I walk. <laughs> so he doesn't actually walk with me. He's, he, I don't think he's ever walked with me. Charlie, not too high, please. What's the best thing about being up the top of a tree? You get to see stuff. What can you see? Who's coming? Well, there isn't anyone coming. This is my sea. No one can have it. <laughs> That's the extent of our dog walk. We don't know. Uh, he gets bored very, very, very quickly. Charlie, wait! In the search for clues to explain Charlie's worrying behaviour, doctors Dawn and Ravi have brought in two experts. Child psychologist Dr Nicola Kennelly and speech and language therapist Helen Gill are taking a road trip to Cumbria. You're going to carry out the assessment, aren't you, today? Yeah. And then I'm going to be watching and making notes. They're aiming to find out if Charlie is developing, typically, or like a child with autism. Hello. Hiya. Hi. Dr Kennelly will investigate his communication by playing games and asking questions, while Helen makes notes about his unspoken communication, his body language. What I'd like you to do, Charlie, is to play with these for a while. Together, they're looking for clues that might point to autism. Does he lack imagination? I really want my bath. Yeah. Does he take everything too literally? So we've got here a pretend sink, we've got two pretend taps, we've got a pretend toothbrush. Show me and tell me how you would brush your teeth with those things. I only have one tap. Oh, at home you've only got one tap. One part of the assessment is where we actually ask the child to stand up and to retell a story from the cards that they've seen in front of us. The, the, uh, the, the fisherman caught a fish and the cat was going to get it. And what we're looking for at that point is how well they use their hands to express themselves. The, and the, at the bucket and put it and thought he put it on the deck bit. We want to know whether children understand emotions and whether they can describe emotions. So what sort of things, Charlie, do you like doing that make you feel happy and cheerful? I don't know. What does it mean, being a friend to you? What does it mean? I don't know. The arrival of a plate of biscuits lulls Charlie into thinking the assessment is over. But Helen's still on the job. Does he give eye contact? Does he chat? How does he react to biscuits that are slightly different to what he's used to? Not nice. Oh dear. All this is useful intelligence for the approaching day of diagnosis, when the whole team must decide what's going on with Charlie once and for all. Interrupted sleep can be another characteristic of autism. Come on. No, I don't want to go to bed. And it's one of the reasons why Mum Robin thinks Billy has the condition. So, we've installed CCTV cameras in his bedroom. But Mum's 
totally unprepared for what the footage will reveal. <gasps> GP Dr Dawn and paediatrician Dr Ravi are trying to help two desperate mums who are really struggling with their sons. You can't cope with that on your own 24-7. Is this just a naughty boy? Do eight-year-old Charlie... This is my seat! No one can have it. <laughs> no. And three-year-old Billy... No! No! Don't! No! ...have autism. Up to 80% of children with autism suffer from unusual sleep. And because Billy and Charlie's mums have both reported erratic sleep patterns, we've installed CCTV cameras in their bedrooms to see what the problem might be. Billy's mum has said that she finds it really difficult to get him to go to bed at night time, and also, once he's asleep, he's up and down all night. Dr Ravi sent the CCTV clips to sleep expert Deb Sugden. <laughs> it's a good thing you showed me this. And today, Billy and family are going to discuss what she's found. So just looking at the sleep now, and my heart really went out to you, Robin, because you're sitting there for three hours a night, yeah. most nights, reading. Am I right in thinking that generally uh -huh. Billy goes to sleep around 11ish? Between 11 and 1 a.m. <laughs> and how is Billy in the morning? How does he wake up? Oh, he doesn't. <laughs> Okay. So if you no let him wake up naturally, it was waking at 8.30, 9-ish, or is it later sometimes? He woke me up at half past 12 in the afternoon the other day. <laughs> OK. In a way, it's good that he's making up for some sleep, because he doesn't get very much. What, what I'd love to do is just have a quick chat with Robin, because, you know... Debs is keen to keep what the CCTV footage has shown a secret between her and Robin. So much because it reveals an unexpected reason why Billy's not sleeping. Why do you think Billy doesn't sleep? Because his brain is constantly going. Your feeling is that his mind just won't stop working. No. OK, but just watch this. <gasps> Actually, he's on Billy's pillow, so Billy can't even put his head down. That's Terrible. So the dog is actually pushed Billy out of bed. So you're popping him back and he's going back to bed absolutely beautifully. And then who joins Billy in bed? The cat. <laughs> <laughs> he's literally shove, shoving him out. It would be very interesting to see if when the cat and the dog are put in another room, whether Billy actually sleeps through. The video footage has given a clue to Billy's broken nights, but will the team think it's significant? We're also monitoring Charlie's sleep with CCTV. And his refusal to sleep is proving more violent. Charlie is banned from playing his computer games for the whole of the next day. I just woke up. You know, today you haven't got your Xbox or your iPad, don't you? I punched more than one kicked her because I wanted to watch the rest of Bug's life. Why did you do that with your cross? Mm hmm. There you go. It grinds you down daily. But if I say I'm going to do something, I have to stick to it, and that's what I have to do, so you have to follow it through. Dr Ravi has asked child psychologist Dr Nicola Kennelly to analyse the CCTV footage to see what she can learn about last night's incident. But it's not the outburst that interests her most. She's doing a bit of body rocking. And that 
to me is something that much younger children do and that can be quite self-soothing and perhaps what he's trying to do is calm himself down. She's seen this constant rocking before during Charlie's assessment and thinks it could be relevant when she reports back to the team later on. It's time for Dr Dawn to bring everyone together for a decision on Billy. Mum thinks he has autism because he lines his toys up, obsesses about the television and sleeps badly. But will the experts agree? The reason I want a diagnosis is because he starts school next year and I don't want him going in and being seen as the naughty child. <laughs> What's prompted mum and gran to seek help is some concerns about how to control his behaviour. And I wonder whether some of his behaviour during the day might be related to the fact he's not sleeping yeah. particularly well yeah. at night. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Bedtime is 7.30 to 8, totally appropriate, but he's not falling to sleep until between 11pm and 1am because mum is reading to him for three hours. Wow. I am absolutely shattered. I wish I had half that energy at half past three this morning. How did you get on the bed? He's a delightful little boy. Um, I didn't see any issues that I was concerned about. His understanding was, was age appropriate. Um, he could even answer some questions which was actually more advanced than you would expect for his age. I don't think any of us really think that any of his behaviour is suggestive of being on the autistic spectrum. Would that, would that be fair to say? No. I'll go and speak to Mum and Grandma, see if they'd like to come and join us, yeah? So, yeah. Great. Okay. It can sometimes be very difficult to tell parents that what they think is going on isn't what's going on. If you don't mind, Aaron, looking after Billy for a while, yeah? yeah? And we'll um, have a little chat about things, yes? Yes. It's completely natural for any parent to worry about their child. We all worry, is this normal behaviour? Which is what Robin is doing. Come take a seat. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello again. Hi there again. Hello. Hello. So I know um, Rob and Tracy, you're quite well acquainted with the team, yeah. um, and obviously we're here to chat about Billy. When we looked at, at Billy's take, when we could see firsthand that, that you know there are issues. Because autism's in the family and you're very aware of it, you'll often sort of pick up on behaviours and think, well, could that be autism? Yeah. And you could fit anything into autism if you tried hard enough. And this I think, is it, because none of them are the same. Exactly, <laughs> and we're all looking for explanations for things. A couple of things that really struck me was how great his language is. His, his imagination was just tremendous, and that doesn't really tie in with typical autism. They're very literal, and, and, and that's that. And in fact, you know, Libby, I think, would, would say straight away that not only is Billy very good with communication for his age, he's probably better than he should be. So I didn't feel that it was necessary to go down the formal route of assessing for autism because I didn't see anything that would indicate that. I, I think I would take away that it's very much a positive thing. Yeah. That oh, yeah, definitely. You really don't yeah. feel he's on the spectrum. That's it. That's brilliant, you know, because, I mean, it can mean so much more for him now. You know, in life, he's going to get on, he's going to, you know... I don't think there's any doubt that that little boy's <laughs> going to get on in life. So, if it's not autism, then what is it? <laughs> Basically, he must be chronically sleep-deprived. I know it sounds crazy, but sleep can actually impact on everything that you're seeing. If you're worried about getting your children to sleep, don't worry, it's now got a name. Delayed sleep phase syndrome is a disorder where sleep is delayed two or more hours past the conventional bedtime. This delay in falling asleep causes difficulty with concentration and behavioural problems. So it's no wonder that his behaviour, sometimes he just erupts like a volcano. I would hope that we'd be able to shift his sleep phase to a more age-appropriate time. Sleep is key for small children. Should go and have a hug with Billy? <laughs> All the best. Not only is Billy, I think, a normal child, he's actually a very bright child who has got problems with sleeping and who probably needs to get out and socialise and be a bit more active. And I think if we do that for him, we're going to see a very different little boy. Hello. 
Maxine knows how important it is for boys to let off steam. Charlie loves climbing trees, so she's come up with an idea to lure him away from video games. So I'll go first, and you follow me. Okay. She's booked a one-to-one -one climbing lesson. <laughs> That's it, Charlie. Excellent. I bring Charlie to things like this. I don't always join in with him, but because he hasn't really got any friends, we tend to have to do things together. You can jump from there if you want. After 20 minutes, the instructor is redundant. Charlie's taken over. What am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, I'm All right, shush. I don't know what I'm doing. It's taken over completely. I just told you the rules. OK. It's quite unusual for beginners to take over the class. Charlie seems happy to invent his own game. I have no idea what I'm doing. No, no. I lost. This is... Charlie, is your mum a good climber? No. <laughs> what do you mean, no? Are you a good climber? Yeah. The following week, diagnosis day at last looms for Charlie and his family. Until now, getting the right professionals in a room to discuss him has proven a nightmare for Maxine. Today I'm, I'm feeling quite apprehensive. We've been waiting a very, very long time for this day. For years, she's only had the support of her parents as she struggled to manage a son who's excluded from school, refuses to leave the house, and is sometimes violent. But after all the waiting, is she ready to hear Dr Ravi's definitive news? I know it's not what you want your child to have, but I've just not been believed for so long. Making me emotional now. <laughs> For the past four years, Maxine's been struggling for someone to recognise her eight-year-old son Charlie's problems. He hates change and he's prone to violent outbursts. Getting the right diagnosis for Charlie would mean a great deal. It would mean people would understand him. It would mean he would get the correct support. It would mean I would know how to deal with my child. What do you think they're going to say? After a series of assessments, our team of experts are meeting to discuss whether the eight-year-old has a diagnosable behavioural condition. So, Helen and Nicola, you went together, I think, did you, to do the autism assessment. How did you we get did. on? One of the tasks that I have to do is a demonstration task, and I have to say he is a pretend sink with two pretend taps, and Charlie said, I only have one tap in the bathroom and looked quite confused and I guess that's a sign of how literal he thinks. So very rigid very, thinking. Yeah. yeah. Put your socks back on. Stinky feet. And the other thing that we noticed was how many mannerisms that he displayed. And children on the autistic spectrum often display quite repetitive behaviours. He did. He did quite a lot of um, body rocking. He took the sock off and he was repeatedly flicking his foot. In these sorts of behaviours, they seem to come about once the social pressure was okay. increased. So what I'm hearing from you then is there are lots of things adding up to say this child almost certainly is on the autistic spectrum. I decided to give a questionnaire that's quite new called the Extreme Demand Avoidance Questionnaire to think a little bit more about the profile of Charlie's behaviour and a child of his age should receive a score of less than 50 and he received a score of 68. So he fit quite an obvious pattern of pathological demand avoidance. And it's, um, it's said, isn't it, with pathological demand avoidance, is that it, it's all to do with control. Children on the autistic spectrum like to be able to control a situation. If you're asking them to do things where they don't really understand why and they can't control it, they, mm. they, their response is to avoid it mm. by melting yeah. down. Pathological demand avoidance is a new diagnosis within the autism spectrum. Just like any child with autism, Charlie struggles with social interaction and is prone to obsessions, such as his computer games. PDA is a form of autism in which a child feels extreme anxiety when faced with even the smallest of demands, leading to violent outbursts or refusing to leave the house. We're probably at the stage we're ready to invite Maxine to join us, aren't we? Okay. Sounds good. The family is about to hear the team's verdict. It's a moment that will change Charlie's life forever. Hi, Charlie, how are you? Do you want to come through and we'll have a little chat? 
don't want to chat. No. Charlie doesn't want to be part of the conversation. You don't have to chat, Charlie. Mom. But he agrees to come to the meeting in a silent capacity. Hi, Charlie. Oh, yes. Nice to see you again. Yes. Charlie. <laughs> Let's just start. Ravi, do you want to kick off? Yeah, Charlie, do you know why we've all been coming and chatting to you and asking you all those silly questions? Well, what it is, because you've had such a bad time, we wanted to see whether there was anything that we could do to try and make life better for you. Does that sound OK? Now, our feeling is that Charlie does sit on the autistic spectrum. Now, within that, he fulfills a lot of the criteria for a particular sub-diagnosis within the autistic spectrum that's called pathological demand avoidance. Charlie doesn't respond to traditional parenting, so Maxine needs to learn a new approach where demands are kept to a minimum by turning them into games or blaming a demand on another authority, not her. It's things like, I don't want to go to school, you don't want to go to school, but the Queen says we have to go to school. Yeah. So we're going to go to school. I you know, and it's... the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> but now that we've got this, it's important that we link in with your local services mm -hmm. so that, number one, Charlie can get back to education, mm -hmm. but it needs to be the right place with the right people, whatever that might be. And I just say thank you very much oh. to oh, all of you, because... I know it's not what you want your child to have, but it's just a relief that I've just not been believed for so long. It's four years of uh, trying to get it sorted and you've done it all in five weeks. You're making me emotional now. <laughs> this is marvellous, isn't it? We don't, have to, we don't have to keep hunting anymore. I think when we gave Maxine our diagnosis, although she seemed upset, I think underlying all that was a sense of relief. <laughs> Are we going now? <laughs> She's known for a long time that there's been something underlying Charlie's behaviour, and I suspect she'd probably worked out what was going on before anyone else had. Oh. Since being told that he doesn't, in fact, have autism, things are changing at Billy's house. Deb Sugden is working with Robin to tackle his late sleep phase syndrome. We want Billy to learn to go to sleep quickly rather than you having to read to him for three hours plus. The idea is for Robin to move Billy's bedtime gradually earlier over the next six weeks to reset his sleep phase. And once asleep, Make sure he's undisturbed by removing the pets from his room. <laughs> Ignoring Billy crying is proving really difficult. That was the hardest one so far. Yeah, it's quarter past seven in the morning and um, Billy had a really good night last night. He slept all night. Yay! Wakey, wakey. <laughs> right, you don't want to stop tickling me. Get out of bed! <laughs> Now he's got better sleeping habits, Robin needs to get Billy watching less television and using up his energy with more physical activity. Hello. So Dr Dawn suggested he join a mini rugby club. I'm chasing you. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. We're a lot happier. 
We don't have so many outbursts these days. Not as many as we were having. <laughs> new Billy is happy. Yeah. <laughs> In Cumbria, Maxine's been doing her homework on pathological demand avoidance, and she's learning new strategies to keep demands to a minimum. Here, darling. I need you to come off in 10 minutes, so when that sand's gone through, can you come down? Yeah? OK, thank you. The sand time is telling him that he's got to come off, and by doing that, I haven't given him that demand. So he can either start calling the sand timer names, <laughs> but it's not me. Do you want to come down and have some lunch now, darling? Come on, then. <coughs> you know, he's coming, oh, right, the sand's gone through, and he's just walked in, and he's just done what, done what we've asked him to do, and it's quite, wow, you know, what happened there? <laughs> and local services are embracing Charlie's diagnosis, and Maxine okay, okay. no longer feels yeah. alone. I want to get him back into education, be looking at new schools, which will be a massive step forward for us. Well, I'm always, I want to be a digger. A digger? <laughs> no, I mean, like, why you dig up stuff. <laughs> An archaeologist? Mm hmm What, dig up old stuff? Mm hmm Archaeologist. Oh, what? Archaeologist. Oh. He's got a lot of potential, and with the right support, which hopefully what this diagnosis is now going to be put in place, he's going to go really far. <laughs> oh. Gorgeous, aren't you? Mm hmm you are lovely. Mm -hmm.